Lord be with you. Friends, welcome to worship this Sunday morning. I've got a couple of announcements to uh, lift up. Uh, first of all, we, uh, we're going to have a congregational meeting on November 22nd, so in two, uh, two weeks. Of course, that's for uh, doing the budget, the terms of call, and to elect the nominating uh, committee. So I encourage you all to uh, be here that Sunday to, um, to, to have some good conversation and to uh, cast your votes and your voice as a member of this congregation. Uh, I just want to stress again the, uh, the mid midweek opportunities that we're uh, having here at the church. Um, Tuesday morning Bible study, 10 o'clock. I strongly encourage you all to come out. We're uh, going through the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, this is a, a heavy doctrine, and, and a lot is in there. Having some good discussion, some good debate, uh, and uh, hopefully, hopefully we, we will continue to grow and learn in that. And then Wednesday evening, I, I really want to encourage you all to come up to that too. Uh, we're studying the commands of Christ. We're talking about what Jesus has actually told us to do. Uh, and, and we have to go through and think about them and how to live uh, the way Jesus wants us to live. So I just want to, again, put that out there, remind you all uh, to, to continue to uh, come out and support these ministry opportunities that, we, uh, that we're offering, that uh, I'm putting time and energy into. I would like to encourage you to come out and do that. One other thing you'll see that's a little bit different this morning, uh, today is All Saints Day. Uh, every few years it falls on a Sunday. And so today we're going to uh, do something special in worship, and we're going to uh, take a sort of a page or, uh, out of the Catholic Church's book, uh, their liturgy, and uh, a little later in our service, I'm going to invite you all to come forward and to light a candle uh, from, from this little basket here, light a candle for um, a deceased loved one or friend or someone who was uh, close to you, um, and just... Put, place it here within this uh, box. This box is full of sand, uh, and you can just place the, the candle into it. Um, so again, I, I'd like to encourage you, you, you'll see in the bulletin where that, where that happens, um, and just come as you, as you feel moved. Uh, we're not doing it like communion. We have to come up each row, uh, just however the Spirit moves you uh, to come forward and to, to light a candle or two. So uh, are there any other announcements this morning? All right. Well, seeing none, let us prepare our hearts to worship the Lord.
Good morning. Good morning. Hear now our call to worship from Psalms 34, verses 15 through 22. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and saves such, a, such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. The Apostle Paul urges, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Therefore, let us offer our prayer of confession. Holy God, you set before us a rich feast of blessing, but we are drawn to lesser things that cannot satisfy. Our ways are not your ways, our thoughts do not descend to your thoughts. Forgive us when we fall short of your commands for our lives. We ask this in the name of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> Amen. God's love is sure and steadfast, always providing a way out, a way through, a way back to him. Through the waters of baptism, we have died with Christ and are raised with him. With gratitude in faith, we will walk the way of the cross. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. We seek in you your word, O God as though we are searching for water in a dry and weary land. By the power of your Holy Spirit, may this word be to us a rich feast satisfying the soul. Then with our mouths we will praise you, and with our lives we will bless you, our host and our hope. Amen. Our first scripture lesson comes from Revelations. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these? clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
This is the word of the Lord. Disciples of Jesus, children of God, let us bring before God a portion of all that he has so freely given to us. Well, friends, let us dedicate these offerings with this prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks for the light of the world, Jesus Christ, through whom we have become co-heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in your promise. Receive the gifts we offer in union with Christ Jesus, our brother, and help us to live to the honor and glory of your name. Amen. Now, friends, while the music is playing, I'd like to invite you to come forward and, like I said, light a candle for a loved one who's passed away in, in your life, and I'll just start us off. So, if Linda, if you would like to get us going.
truly a testament of the great cloud of witnesses. Friends, I'd like to invite you to join me in our prayer, uh, this litany for the saints. God of life, thank you for each person you have placed in this congregation and for the gifts you have given them. We pray that everyone here, rich and poor, men and women, young and old, will find effective ways to use their gifts for the common good. May our witness encourage and challenge all who come to know and use the gifts you have them given for your purposes in this world. God of our salvation, we bless and thank you for calling us to be saints and to share every good gift with other members of your body. We pray that our daily testimony will be a lavish sharing of these gifts. We pray for generous hearts and open Bibles. We pray for the active and powerful work of your spirit in our lives and in this community so that others may experience the kind of fellowship that is only possible because of what Jesus has done for us. God of all ages, we thank you for the faithful witness of your apostles, prophets, and martyrs throughout the history of your church and throughout the world even today. Through their witness, we see and hear your truth. We bless you for all who bless your name through their writing, speaking, art, and music. Through their work, we glimpse your beauty. We praise you for all who serve you without recognition or honor, offering encouragement to the lonely, the sick, and the fearful. Through their lives, we see your faithfulness and sense your comfort. O Lord, whose holy saints in all times and places have endured affliction, suffering, and tribulation, by the strength of your power, we pray, send your Holy Spirit, the comforter and advocate of all Christians, to sustain your people in their martyrdom, witness, and mission. The world without provocation hates your church, but you have taught us not to despair. Therefore, you who are a God at hand and not a God far off, grant to these Christians the power to lift up their hands, their eyes, and their hearts to continue their living witness in unity with the universal church to the glory of your most holy name. Now we pray that you will use even us to reflect the glory we see in Christ. May the voices of all your saints made holy in Christ, swell in joyous praise to you, the giver of all good gifts, through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And now we are bold to pray as Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, church, we get a little break from the Gospel of Mark this morning, uh, for since it is such a special occasion, uh, All Saints Day, uh, this message today is actually on the great cloud of witnesses, so I, I would like to invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, where we have this phrase given to us. Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. 
You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Friends, it's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. May we be taught by this word to place our trust only in God and to serve and honor him as we ought, so that we may glorify his holy name in all our living and edify our neighbor by our good example. Amen. Today's message is also taking a page out of a Baptist. We're going to do a three-point sermon this morning. We're just getting all types of denominations in today. But before we dive into sort of the, the content of what a witness is, we kind of need to find that. We need to find what, it, what a witness is in terms of what the author mentions here from the great cloud of witnesses. The Greek word, we, we know it, martus. It literally means one who remembers. Of course, a martus is someone who in a courtroom, is a trustworthy source of information. It is a person who has a testimony to the truth, and he or she bears it in, in, in a court of law. Those who bear testimony to the truth of the gospel, in this sense, and in our case, they bear witness through their lives, through their testimony, through their actions and words and deeds. Some will lose their life for the sake of the gospel, and we call them martyrs, which is what this word is translated into, martus. Now, some live their whole lives for the gospel, and we call them saints. Acts chapter 10, verses 38 through 43, defines for us what this gospel is. So if we know now what a witness is, we need to know what this witness is bearing testimony to, what it is that we testify. And so we have it. Apostle Peter tells us, starting in verse 38 in Acts, if you want to turn there in your Bibles, I encourage you, we're going to be in Acts for a little bit. He says, you know of Jesus of Nazareth. What is witnessed by, what is testified to what we show and see and proclaim is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. In its most simplest form, that is what we are witnessing and what we bear witness to. The apostle continues, not only do we know of Jesus of Nazareth, we also know how, he, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. So the person of Jesus Christ, he was anointed by God. He was chosen, appointed, called from eternity past, long before creation, for the great plan of redemption. Indeed, God had this plan of redemption set in place before the foundation of the world. Long before anything was ever thought of, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit covenanted with a plan to redeem God's people. And so the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, was upon Christ with power, displaying Jesus' authority as the Son of God and as the judge of nations. We look at Jesus' life and work and how his miracles and his teaching point to that authority. And we can see that only through the Holy Spirit. So not only do we know this Jesus of Nazareth and how he was anointed by God, we also know how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him, says the apostle. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, Jesus displayed his divine authority by healing, by bringing wholeness, by exercising demons, by bringing forgiveness of sins, by feeding the hungry, by seeking the lost, by nourishing the soul. 
And so his miracles are testimonies themselves. They too are witnesses, but witnesses of something greater, something more powerful. They are witnesses to his awesome power and to his authority as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Verse 39, we also are witnesses of all the things that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Now, Peter, in this instance, when he says we, he is talking about himself and the other disciples, how they were witnesses of Jesus' authority, firsthand accounts of the healing, of the miracles, of the power that the Holy Spirit. They saw how he ministered throughout Palestine and in Jerusalem. They were there. And they were also witnesses of the horror that was done to Christ. They also put him to death, he says, by hanging him on a cross. His own countrymen put him to death to preserve their own power and their own authority structures over the masses. Rather than submit to the Messiah, they crucified him. Despite their attempts to squash him, despite their attempts to silence him, the grave could not even hold the majestic power of Almighty God. For verse 40 tells us, God raised him up on the third day. Satan had no victory over Christ. The power and glory of God the Father made Christ a victor over death, the, the punishment for man's rebellion and over Satan, who is the tempter who leads people astray. And of course, God does this in his mysterious, in his sovereign wisdom. Why did Jesus have to die on that cross? Why does God have to accept such a blood sacrifice? It was necessary, and it was needed. And so, this God who appointed Christ granted that he be revealed, but not to all people in verse 41. The resurrected Christ was not made known to every man, woman, and child. Rather, he was revealed to witnesses who had been chosen beforehand by God. That is to us, says Peter, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. God's chosen witnesses for the glory of the gospel were the apostles. They were called and commissioned and appointed by Christ to bear testimony to the world about him. And so we see here that our religion is a transmitted religion, meaning that God isn't revealing new revelation to people. God isn't adding to the scriptures day by day. Rather, what God has spoken, what God has done in the person of Christ, that is what we are to know and to trust and to learn. And so that information is transmitted to us even some 2,000 years later. We have witnesses, and they have a singular common testimony that does not change and has no error. And of course, that witness is in the pew back in front of you. These witnesses God ordered in verse 42 to preach to the people and to testify solemnly that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To preach, to testify, to bear witness to, to proclaim. That is the duty of every witness, the call of every disciple, the role of every church member. We are all preachers to an extent because we are all sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Of course, the word here to preach means to herald, to proclaim, to announce, to shout from the rooftops, 
to share with all those whom you encounter. And the word here to testify means to bear full and complete witness before another. So put those together. You bear the full witness, the full testimony of Jesus Christ, of who he is and what he has done for us. And you bear that witness to everyone. You bear that testimony to whomever you encounter. Peter closes by reminding us that the apostles were not only witnesses, were not the only witnesses who were called to testify of Christ. He says, all the prophets testify of him, that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. The whole of scripture, and for Peter, that's the Old Testament, and for us, it's the whole Bible. All of it testifies to Christ. From cover to cover, Jesus is on every page, and the message is the same. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins, which is the only way into the kingdom of God. And so we have a great cloud of witnesses testifying this message. This is what we are proclaiming. This is what many have died proclaiming. We are surrounded by saints and martyrs who proclaim the good news of the gospel, which Peter summarized. And so today I want to look at three groups of witnesses, ancient, historic, and modern. And I want you to keep in mind that we are not separate from this great cloud, but very much a part of it. And I'll touch on that at the end. First, we have the ancient witness, which is the testimony of Scripture. The testimony of Scripture helps us to rid ourselves, says the author to a letter letter to Hebrews, says to rid ourselves of every obstacle, looking only at Jesus. Luke chapter 24, verses 45 and 48. This is a post-resurrection experience. He says, then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. The Bible is a wonderful storehouse of testimony. We just need to look into its pages to see the the depth and the power and the wisdom. Every word, every phrase the Apostle Paul tells us is profitable for teaching and for reproof. We learn who God is from Scripture. We learn who we are from Scripture. We learn how to interact with God from Scripture, and we learn how to interact with others from Scripture. Therefore, our minds must be opened to the testimony of these ancient writings. And Jesus explains that testimony for us in verse 46 of that same chapter in Luke. And he said to them, so it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. The passion of Christ was necessary for the redemption of God's people. There's nothing that we can ignore about that. And there is no other way around it. The testimony of Scripture is that man's sin required a payment that man could not afford. And so God ordained sacrifices in the Old Testament These sacrifices were but foreshadows, but types, kinds that pointed to the ultimate and necessary sacrifice of the Son of Man. Jesus continues in verse 47. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The passion, death, and resurrection of Christ purchase, purchase repentance for the forgiveness of sins. There is a cosmic economic exchange that happened at the cross. Our righteousness, or excuse me, our unrighteousness, 
our filthy rags, our sins, were put on Christ as he hung on that cross. And here's the exchange. His righteousness, his pure garments, his wonderful robes were put on our shoulders. Just as the prodigal was welcomed home and his father clothed him with his own robe, we too are exchanged. And so the testimony of this glorious, life-changing, mind-transforming truth is to be proclaimed to all the nations. There is a way to be reconciled with God, and it's through Jesus Christ. The scriptures testify this, and the church is the witness who proclaims this throughout the ages. And so this fact leads me to my second witness, the historic witness, which I call the testimony of doctrine. Now, I may have just lost some of you by mentioning that word, doctrine, Whenever doctrine is mentioned, some folks are like, oh, that's not for me. I'm not a theologian. I haven't gone to seminary. I'm not a scholar. I don't need to study all that. Why do we even need to study doctrine at all? Don't all I need is is love? Well, beloved, if, if that's you, loving God and loving neighbor falls under the doctrine of sanctification. We can't avoid doctrine. We think that doctrine is a a dirty word because we associate it with things like indoctrination. People think of brainwashing or legalistic expectations when we hear the word doctrine. But the Greek word most often translated as doctrine is the word teaching. I know we got a lot of teachers here. Are you all offended by teaching? I hope not, then you shouldn't be offended by doctrine. Doctrine is simply teaching. Why do we teach? Teachers, you, you know, why do we teach? Why do you spend so many hours, years teaching? It's likely to imbue some bit of wisdom in a child, some bit of knowledge in a person, some bit of understanding on your students. You're also likely to be a caring role model, to be perhaps even a stable force in that person's life, or a reliable resource whom can be approached. Christian doctrine is the same. And so the testimony of doctrine, as the author to a letter of the Hebrews says, helps to rid ourselves of the sin which so easily entangles us. Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Paul says, do you not know? First, let me stop there. Paul clearly appeals to our understanding. The apostle plainly expects us to be able to comprehend something, to be able to comprehend a teaching. The apostle Paul expects us to be able to wrap our heads around doctrine. God has given us the ability and the capacity to apprehend the things about himself. So Paul now elaborates on one such teaching. Do you not know the one to whom you present yourselves as slaves for obedience? You are slaves of that same one whom you obey. In verse 19, Paul tells us that he is speaking in human terms. So he's telling us that he's using the illustration of of slavery to help us understand the doctrine, there's the word, the teaching of the bondage of the will. If you're a slave or a servant, you're obedient to your master. Usually whatever he commands you to do, you do it. If you've ever served in the military, if your commanding officer says jump, you respond, how high? Not, I don't want to do that. That's the role of the slave. And so for emphasis, Paul reverses the direction. That which you obey, 
That is, to whomever you owe obedience, that person or thing is your master. That's what he's trying to teach us here. And so that which you obey is your master, Paul says, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Every human being on this earth is a slave to something, is a slave to one of two masters. You're either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. I know we Americans hate to think that way, but there are no independent contractors in the economy of God. The truth is, and this is the painful truth, is that every natural born man, woman, and child is a slave to sin. That's our inheritance from our forefather Adam, the federal head of our family. But thanks be to God, interjects Paul, verse 17, that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching, doctrine, to which you were entrusted. And after being freed from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. You see, Christ Jesus paid the debt that no man could afford. And so those whom he redeemed, those who are purchased by Christ and called Christians, they were bought from something, from another master. And so the Christian now has a new master. That master is the Lord Jesus. Jesus doesn't purchase our freedom in the sense that we're now free agents to do whatever we want. Jesus didn't purchase our past to be an independent contractor. He purchased our slavery. And he is our new master. And what a glorious master to have. We should be happy and thankful that Jesus is our master. For in him is life. In him is grace. In him is compassion. In him is love. In him is goodness. What's the result of the other master, of sin? In sin, we have death. In sin, we have condemnation. In sin, we have fear. In sin, we have hatred. In sin, we have wickedness. If we are slaves to sin, then these are the tools of our master. But as slaves to righteousness, we are obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And here's my point. The teaching here entrusted to us are the doctrines prescribed in Scripture and described throughout church history. The Bible teaches certain things. And Christians have been applying these things for over 2,000 years. And of course, every generation has challenges, hurdles to overcome, persecutions to undergo. And so this is what gives to us our historic witness. God calls forth saints from among the masses, men and women who are prime examples of God's empowering grace even after the time of the apostles. We can look to Augustine of Hippo, the teacher of Christ and him crucified. Martin Luther Yesterday was the Reformation Day. He was the clarion call of justification by faith alone. John Knox, the, the trumpet of reform in Scotland and England, leading the way for us to be gathered here today. These three examples are but tiny drops in the bucket of saints used by God for developing doctrines in his church. And so the purpose of these historic witnesses, these doctrines, is to help us to rid ourselves of sin. You see, sin keeps us focus, or keeps us from focusing on God. It keeps us looking at ourselves or what our passions are, what our desires are, what makes me happy, what fits my schedule. 
what brings me comfort. And sin keeps us from experiencing God's grace and love. Sin prevents us from loving God and loving our neighbor. And so Scripture commands that we mortify sin, that we turn away from it. But how do we know what sin is? How do we identify it in our lives? It is doctrine. It is teaching that shows us what sin is by pointing to the definitions in Scripture. Doctrine reveals to us the ways that sin resides in our hearts using the descriptions that are in Scripture. And doctrines teach us how to repent, how to forgive, and how to live. J. Gresham Macon said this. He said, indifference to doctrine makes no heroes of the faith. Indifference to doctrine makes no heroes of the faith. See, doctrine is not merely theological, though anything theological is immensely important. You see, doctrine cannot be juxtaposed against a life in Christ. That's Macon's point. You can't separate doctrine and Christian living. Doctrine and life are intimately connected. And the great cloud of of witnesses that surrounds us and in which we participate is full of defenders and practitioners of doctrine. And so this leads me to my final witness this morning, the modern witness, which is the testimony of practice. The testimony of practice helps us, as the apostle says, run with endurance the race that is set before us. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, speaking to his protege, he says this in verse 5. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelled in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am sure that is in you as well. Paul's words of encouragement to Timothy, whom he considered a son, reveal to us the importance of modern saints and their practical testimony. Timothy has a sincere faith, says the Apostle Paul. That Greek word literally translates to without hypocrisy. That's what sincere means. There's nothing false in his faith. There's nothing artificial in his faith. And Timothy learned this sincere faith from his grandmother and from his mother. It is so vitally important that we all have mentors in the faith. Each of us is at some point a child in our faith journey. And we rely on the wisdom and the nurture and the maturity of someone in the faith. Some of these folks may be our own parents, like in the case of Timothy. Some may be a teacher or a supervisor, or simply a friend. But my hope is that each and every one of these candles lit before us represents a modern witness of a testimony of practiced faith. Paul continues to Timothy in verse 6. For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. In light of the testimony of Timothy's mother and grandmother, in light of their witness in his life, Paul urges Timothy to kindle afresh the gift of God. The testimony of practice is that modern witnesses help us to rekindle or remind us of the gifts of God in our lives. The young child who rekindles God's joy in a father's life. The elderly parent who rekindles God's hope in a daughter's life. The stranger who rekindles God's compassion in a weary life. A friend who rekindles God's teaching in an encumbered 
life. Each and every one of us is a part of this great cloud of witnesses. Our modern day saints help us to refocus, reorient, and rekindle God's good gifts. Because God gives us a spirit of power, of love, and discipline. Now I will say these three make unusual bedfellows. We don't always put love and power and discipline together. But ask any athlete, and he'll tell you perhaps in different words, but nonetheless he'll tell you what it takes, how it takes power, love, and discipline to endure the race. Power, ability, strength, these things help us to overcome the opposing forces. Love, support, nurture. They're there to encourage continued practice. Discipline, critique, structure. These are there to correct and perfect. If you ask any athlete, he or she will tell you that all three of those are part of his life. And so how are we then part of this great cloud of witnesses? Well, we start by asking ourselves, are you grounded in Scripture? Do you find your strength in the Word of God? Do you turn to the Word of God for the power to press on? Are you conformed by doctrines, the teachings, do you structure yourself around sound teaching? And do you discipline yourself according to God's design? Are you nurtured by endurance? Do you find words of encouragement in the Bible? Do you find direction in doctrines of the church? And do you find support and guidance in the lives of others? And are you a role model for someone? Do you model God's grace and God's compassion? Do you bear witness to God's love and Christ's redemption? Do you testify to God's providence and God's command? as you reflect on the many saints in your life, in the way that you too are a saint in someone else's life, I invite you to pray. Pray for ways that God can continue to make you a witness for the gospel. Let us pray. Holy God, we come before you with adoration on our lips. We adore you for the testimony of the ancients, which is preserved for us in Scripture. Indeed, without this testimony, we would have a baseless faith, a foundation on sand rather than on rock. And so, God, as we look to the Scriptures, as we look to this great foundation you've prepared before us, we come before you in confession. Confession for the times that we turn from your testimony when we've turned from the doctrines of your church, when we turn from the teachings which she has handed down to us. Lord, we seek your forgiveness and correct us and bring us back into the way and into the truth. And Lord, we, we give you thanksgiving for the many testimonies of practical faith by saints we know and love. It's great to look over history. It's great to look into the scriptures. But sometimes it's more powerful to look at a friend, to look at a loved one, and see how you have been working in their life. And so we pray for supplication. For those in this world who have never heard of the gospel, may we be the model and the witness of God's truth in their life. May we 
be a, a saint in the life of another. May our testimony, may our witness, may our doctrine help another come to you. We pray all this in Christ Jesus. Amen. Church, I'd like to invite you to stand for the profession of your faith. Church, in light of this teaching of God's word, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the grave. He ascended into heaven, and he sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Children of God, may you receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And I name the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go out into this world, joining the great cloud of witnesses in this age and in the ages to come. Amen.